Okay, evening everyone. Um, thanks very much. Um, so, uh, as Raj said, um, uh, we will be rescheduling uh, Dr. Shuranga Priya's um, session. And uh, today, what we're going to do, given that it is Gita Jayanti, um, when he told us uh, he could make it, we thought it would be a good opportunity actually to just share some share some uh, discussions about um, about the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, normally we do this as a conversation um, or an interview style uh, format. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to speak for about 10-15 minutes and um, after that we'll get into a conversation. It doesn't have to be just questions. Um, if, you, uh, if you do have questions, we've got, some, um, we've got this obviously the online platform uh, which we will take questions first through. But hopefully we can also get into a conversation so you may have um, thoughts that you'd like to share on the Gita that we can, um, that we can break out into. So uh, that said, um, today um, was the day that uh, Krishna spoke the Gita um, in Kurukshetra to Arjuna. And um, I was thinking about how do you, you know, what, what could we um, cover in about 15 minutes? Um, the Gita, as you probably all know, um, has been spoken about for millennia. Um, so what we can cover in 15 minutes is, uh, is going to be a tiny, uh, minuscule amount. So, but one of the things that struck me uh, that I've been working on and um, thinking about in terms of the Gita, which I thought I'd like to share, um, is in terms of how the Gita sets out um, its philosophy in a very systematic way, which is uh, universal in its application. So we heard, we've heard from other speakers um, at this event when uh, talking about how the Gita and the Vedic philosophy is quite unique because it springs from a ground of philosophy um, as opposed to just from uh, theology. And um, one of the ways in which we've been thinking about it in terms of the context of um, how does it apply to everyone? How is it truly universal in its, um, in its position? So, um, one, the Gita is known, I'm going to, you, you cannot read that, so don't worry, it's not your eyes. Um, uh, I'm going to zoom in in a minute where you, you will be able to see it. But um, this is a summary uh, illustration um, which is going to be included in, in a publication that um, I'm working on. Um, but it's essentially the yoga ladder. So the Gita is known to many as a book on yoga, and within that is a concept called the yoga ladder. And when I was looking at it, um, I really felt that in this one concept, so many of the other elements of the Gita are included. And so what I'm going to do is go through the steps of the yoga ladder, and hopefully that will um, bring out some of the key points which um, I think are so interesting. So because you cannot read that, um, I'm going to take each section uh, in turn, okay? So hopefully you can read that. So this is the, I'm going to read it out anyway, but this is the, this is the bottom of the yoga ladder, okay? So the bottom of the yoga ladder, actually it's even prior to getting on the yoga ladder, but it's the, it's the ground level if you like. So this is hedonistic life. And on the left, as we go up the ladder we'll be showing, on the left are the results of this type of behavior action, and on the right are the practices, i.e. what does a person on that step do, how do they act, etc. So in a hedonistic life, one is really just doing whatever they want without care for any kind of restraint or regulation, right? They're just trying to enjoy themselves. And uh, the result of that is it's a reactive life with very little free will actually being expressed. And the reason why there's very little free will being expressed is because typically in this state we're being pushed in our choices by our habits and our conditioning. So, the, so and this is a concept called the gunas which we'll come into a bit later on. But the idea is that uh, the Gita explains that there is, there is not just our free will acting all the time, that we are imposed upon uh, by other forces, predominantly the gunas and karma. And uh, they are, of course, related. But So the idea is that as long as we're just searching after our own pleasure, we're not really expressing free will because our, our 
pleasure is being dictated to by our habits and our past conditioning. Does that make sense? Okay, um, so let's get on to the yoga ladder. And the first step is karma. And this is, um, you know, many times if you ask somebody what's the Gita about, they'll say, well, it's about karma. Um, or they'll say, well, it's about um, doing the right thing or something quite, you know, um, basic like that, which it is about that. It does certainly include that. And that's the first step, the yoga ladder. So um, in the middle of that ladder, you can see it says plus. Well, hopefully, I don't even know if you can read that, but it says plus sub-religious principles. And what sub-religious principle means? That that's the step, that's what you need to add to hedonistic life to get to karma. That's what's taking you up the yoga ladder. Does that make sense? So you can see an arrow that goes up to karma and you can see an arrow that goes down, back down to hedonistic life, right? And that's because the yoga ladder is not a one-way process. You can go up the yoga ladder, but you can also down the yoga ladder. So if you take karma and you minus sub-religious principles, you get back down to hedonistic life. So what do we mean by sub-religious principles? So this is when you're acting piously, when you've added into a hedonistic life, which is purely about just go and enjoy yourself, you've added now some kind of regulation, some kind of restraint, some kind of self-control, which typically people draw from religious scripture. Yeah, so religious scripture tells you some do's and don'ts, you do the do's and don'ts, and you kind of get to kind of some level of karma, because now you're acting a bit more piously. And, um, uh, and the result of that, in terms of the left-hand side, is uh, this is the moderated pursuit of material life. So you're, see, you're still pursuing material life, but it's moderated. Um, but uh, yeah, so the only other point here is that it's still yet without um, spiritual awareness. And then the next step up is karma yoga. Okay, and this is why the yoga ladder is called the yoga ladder, because it's about yoga. So here in karma yoga, what have we added? So we've added um, some, S, some uh, now it comes to the point where we're adding some spiritual uh, affection or love or affinity towards the divine. Um, and we're dedicating our activities to that higher purpose. So we're doing the activities, but now instead of doing it for ourselves, we're offering what we're doing to a higher purpose. Now, that's, so you can see that on the right-hand side, where we're dedicating the activities or the fruits of our action for our higher purpose. And there's some preliminary spiritual information. There's some preliminary information or awareness of spiritual identity, um, perhaps some uh, basic information about divinity, and that takes us up to karma yoga. Okay? Okay, this is where it gets tricky because the slide doesn't go any higher if you've noticed. So what, what's going to happen is we're now going to start with karma, the bottom karma yoga you've seen, and jnana yoga one step up. Okay? I haven't lost anyone, have I? Good. So um, now to get to uh, jnana yoga, so again you're seeing these arrows going up and down. Now we've added, um, again, an, an increase in terms of our, our... So you've got the mixed spiritual love and dedicated activities from before. That was the same. And now we've added the cultivation of spiritual knowledge. So this is now actively cultivating spiritual knowledge through, you know, through the different processes we understand, whether it's through scripture, speaking to others. And it's increasing levels of self-discipline. Now what happens here on the right you can see, the, in terms of the practices, is the cultivation of transcendental knowledge, or spiritual knowledge, and the rejection of materialism. So this is where an increasing level of um, stepping away from material activities uh, takes place. And on the left-hand side, in terms of the result, you can see the realization of spiritual self, and initial awareness of the formless aspect of ultimate reality. So that here now what we're starting to do is starting to see um, ourselves in terms of our spiritual identity, um, at least at a certain level, and its relationship with an ultimate reality. Okay? So from Jnana Yoga now at the bottom, we've gone to Dhyana Yoga. Somebody's missed a Y here, but don't worry about that. It's Dhyana Yoga. So um, now here we are attaining control over the mind and senses. This is typically through very complicated practices, which 
which is why it's quite rare in this day and age. Um, and advanced meditation. And advanced meditation means whilst, in, whilst previously there was meditation on the spirit self, i.e. myself as a spiritual identity, this advanced spiritual um, meditation is now upon the super consciousness or the super soul or antayami as it's called, you know, paramatma. There's different words for it, but essentially the indwelling aspect of ultimate reality, God, Krishna, within the heart. So that's the, that's the level of dhyana yoga. And, and this is a very accomplished level of um, meditation. Um, and, and it really is a very advanced stage in terms of knowledge as well. So here we have a perception of the formless aspect and also the all-pervading aspect within the heart. So there's a, there's a, there's a realization here. And then we come to the top of the yoga ladder and this is called unalloyed bhakti yoga and it's unalloyed and it's here because you've been noticing hopefully that through each of the steps um, up the yoga ladder one of the points has been with the plus has been adding mixed spiritual love or mixed devotion and that mixed devotion means it's a love for divinity but it's a conditional form of that love it's a, it's, a, it's a form of love which still holds something back. But at this stage, in terms of unalloyed bhakti, it's selfless. It's a pure, unalloyed um, state of devotion and love to the Supreme. And in the right, the activity is one is engaged directly in developing spiritual love without any form of selfish motivation. And on the left, in terms of the results, is going beyond realization of oneself, one's spirit, going beyond the realization of the divinity within each individual living being. Now at this stage, at the culmination of the yoga ladder, is a loving relationship. A loving relationship with complete realization of all three aspects of, um, of divinity as we described. Um, so that impersonal, the all-pervading aspect within each, being and also the personal or transcendent um, form of divinity, Krishna. So, um, unfortunately, because um, because of the limitations of uh, this um, this <laughs> screen and the size of it, um, you will also see here on the right hand side there's an arrow which goes up straight to unalloyed bhakti yoga. Do you see that? And that's because at any, at, you couldn't see it here, but you can see the line now. You can probably hopefully see where that line is. And it's essentially going all the way up. Because the point is that at any of these stages, any of these stages within, uh, on the yoga ladder, you can actually go directly to unalloyed devotional service. You don't have to go through a stepwise process. You can go directly. Now, whether it's uh, rare or not rare, that's another thing. But in terms of how one can uh, and how Krishna also within the Gita appeals for that um, unalloyed devotion and love and reciprocation with each of us is, um, is there. So it's a possibility and it's up to each individual um, and Krishna describes essentially that these are the different paths. These are the different paths that take us to, um, to these different destinations and um, we can then choose which, which uh, path we take. And it's true also that when we were talking about dhyana yoga and jnana yoga, the process of meditation and self-discipline and ashtanga and these different practices which people normally associate in their minds with yoga practice, these are very, very difficult things uh, physically, mentally. They were, uh, you know, to, to expect um, individuals to do that type of meditation in this day and age is, is uh, probably very unrealistic. So um, the idea being that we look at the steps of this yoga ladder and we try and see what we can practice, how we can practically engage with this. And as Krishna sets out in the Gita really extraordinarily in terms of its simplicity um, of what we can do as first steps on that path um, and fast track ourselves up the yoga ladder. Um, and 
So I said I'll sp speak for um, 15 minutes. I think it's been about 18. So um, I will pause there um, and um, open up to any questions or discussion that um, we would like to get into. So it doesn't have to be about this, obviously. Um, uh, but any topic on the Gita, anything that you'd, you've been thinking about. And we've got some real experts in the audience as well um, who, uh, who might chip in where I fail to answer. Which one would you like to see? Oh, yes. Okay. So yeah, again, if you've got any questions, just go to this website, um, that can be very interesting. Yeah, and if you can't be bothered, then just put your hand up, and Raj will, will give you the mic. Um, and whilst you're, whilst you're thinking about, and he's thinking about the, um, he's thinking about that, I'm going to tell you a little story. So, when I was about 17, I think, um, I'd been, t I'd been, um, going to different temples and going to different places, trying to understand something about, I had a curiosity about, um, about God and um, trying to understand the whole thing. And I'd gone to a number of different places and I couldn't, I hadn't found anywhere where it really satisfied me in terms of the depth or the clarity of answer that I was expecting. And I turned up once at um, Bhaktivedanta Mana and we'd been going there in the 70s when I was just a baby um, and but you know for some reason or another we'd stopped going and I turned up there and um, I went to the reception desk and there were books on the reception desk and one of the books was the Gita so I just I was curious I had nothing to do so I just opened up the Gita and it came to this verse and um, I read it and it really struck me so I'm going to read it for you now and I'll um, it, this is uh, chapter 18, verse uh, 65. And Krishna says, this is coming to the end. There are 18 chapters in the Gita. This is coming to the end of Krishna's instructions. And he says to Arjun as a, well, not the concluding, but one of the concluding statements. He says, always think of me. Become my devotee. Worship me and offer your homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. And I thought, that's a, the, the last sentence really struck me. I promise you this because you're my very dear friend. And it struck me because I thought that's not what my conception of God was in terms of my very dear friend. Um, like there was a, at least at that time, my conception of God was some, I don't know what it was, but certainly not a friend in that sense of somebody you can be friendly with. And, and I think the more I've read of the Gita and the, the tradition of the Gita, um, the more I've felt that this is truly a unique contribution that, um, that we have in terms of the relationships that one can have with divinity. And not just the relationships of servitude and master, but the relationships of intimacy and love, which are described in such depth in the Vedic tradition, that um, it's uh, it's something for mm, yeah, it's something for us to share. I think in our conversations with other traditions, and something that um, yeah we could do more of. I think uh, in terms of how religion actually makes a change and a difference in somebody's life, as opposed to just following rules and regulations. So I thought I'd share that because that for me was a real. Turning point. Okay, do we have any? Yeah. So, um, first question, which is, why does Hinduism have so many gods, but other mainstream religions only have one? <laughs> okay. Something like 330 million other gods. Um, so, yeah, so Hinduism has lots of different gods, apparently. Um, and other traditions have one, and apparently that's supposed to mean that other traditions are very sophisticated and Hinduism is naive, and um, therefore we should all become monotheists and uh, break all the idols. So that's the kind of story that goes around, and that's kind of the, um, the stuff that gets um, pushed down, and also we see, like, because parents can't answer 
uh, or respond to that type of question, typically because they haven't read the Gita. Please read the Gita. So, um, is Krishna makes it quite clear in the Gita, actually. Uh, he makes it quite clear in terms of who the devatas are, um, who these 330 million devatas are, i.e. Um, his agents, if you like, to help administer the affairs of the material world, because um, he's got better things to do. And uh, Krishna is God, so there is one God in Hinduism, um, though he has different features and he has different forms. And that's part of his unlimited nature. If, if divinity has, is unlimited, if he's all-powerful, he and she, I guess, um, then um, that's not a restriction. So, uh, yeah, there's the, there's the point about devatas which comes up a lot, and, um, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's, not, it's not the case that other traditions also don't have agents, such as angels or whatever else they may call them. Um, and in the same way, uh, this principle is there. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's one God, don't worry, but um, uh, Krishna has many different features and those features are described in detail. And the fact is that um, there, there, isn't a, there isn't a detailed description of the features of God in other traditions. So, uh, just like we can learn something from all religions, um, all bona fide religions, we can learn something from, so from the Vedic tradition, we can learn about the personality of God. We can learn about the form of God and his different forms. And um, it's unfortunate if, uh, you know, now there seems to be, or has been, of course, for, because of the nature, I guess, of sectarian religion, this um, resistance to learning from other traditions. My religion is the best better than yours and therefore that means I can't learn anything from yours. Uh, but the fact is that that's a, that's a pretty narrow-minded way to look at the world. So if we open ourselves up to the possibility of learning something from other traditions, I would suggest that actually um, learning about the personality, form and features and activities of God is one thing that the Vedic tradition has a lot to talk about um, and our relationship with that divinity. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so next question is, how does faith pay, play a part in all of this? How does faith play a part in all of this? Um, by that, I think we're talking about, well, that, you don't know anything more than I know, okay. Um, so, how does faith play a part in this? I'm assuming, and please shout out if this is your question and, and I'm not representing it properly, um, I, I understand that that's, that's referring to faith in terms of progress on the yoga ladder um, and um, our increasing levels of um, meditation upon or realization of God. Is that fair? I'm going to carry on unless somebody shouts no. Okay, so um, faith, is a, faith is a really uh, fundamental aspect of of this, in terms of the Sanskrit word being shraddha, uh, and it's being defined in different ways, but one that I like is uh, where one places one's heart. Um, so we look for we look for pleasure. That's what we look for as as spirit souls. Our nature is to look for pleasure, and wherever we think we're going to find pleasure. We put our faith. You see, so like, if I think that um, money will bring me pleasure, I'll put my faith in money, and that's what I pursue. If I think power, well, so you go through the list, right? So it's a placement of the heart. It's a, it's, it's, faith is not purely in a religious context, though we're coming on to that. But the idea is that wherever we really feel that we're going to find pleasure, that's where we put our faith. And that's how we define faith, is that process of placing our heart somewhere. So what's that got to do with this? Well, the point is that the Gita is telling us 
that we can look for pleasure wherever we want to look for it. And typically we're looking, at for, it, looking for it in material things and in material relationships. And Krishna is encouraging us to learn from our experience um, that those things are not going to, have not brought us lasting pleasure. And therefore, uh, we might start to consider that, well, they won't bring us lasting pleasure. And therefore, um, starting to turn our gaze towards a more spiritual approach to life. A more first, as we were going up to the yoga ladder, you saw first introducing regulation and some, uh, some principles of piety, then introducing principles of dedicating our activities to a higher purpose, to divinity, then in, and increasing our loving affection towards divinity. So the idea is that that's a process of faith. It's a process of building faith. It's a process of thinking, okay, actually, my pleasure will more likely or will begin to come from these activities and these things rather than purely from material things. And so that process of rising up the yoga ladder is, I would say, not necessarily even increasing faith, but it's a changing of faith. It's a changing or a shifting of faith from I will find pleasure here to I will find pleasure here. Because the process of finding pleasure is something that we're going to continue to do one way or the other. And therefore, um, yeah, so that, that I think is the, is the role of faith in, um, in this context. So, um, next question. Why can't I live a pious life without necessarily offering the result to God? I mean, you can. <laughs> you can. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing saying you can't. Um, Krishna says in the Gita that I guess the question is, why, why would I not? So um, I, I guess the, the relevant um, remark from Krishna on this in the Gita is that he explains really clearly in terms of these steps of the yoga ladder. So one step is, as we've seen, that one can live a pious life. And one can, through the process of piety, um, accrue that piety uh, to live a happier material materialistic life and in some sense there's nothing wrong with that if that's what one wants but Krishna does make clear the process that that goes is that anything material is transitory by nature it's transitory and therefore the benefits of piety are also transitory they're not they're not eternal so Krishna is making a distinction between what is material though pious and that which is spiritual and therefore eternal i.e. different from that benefit which arises from material piety to that which arises from spiritual activity or spiritual piety and therefore one can situate oneself in a better position materially through piety and that's possible and that's part of the process and a lot of the Vedic texts focus actually on just getting people to a pious level I just, and a lot of religion, it's not just the Vedas, but a lot of religion focuses purely on, not purely, sorry, a lot on um, just religious principles, sub-religious principles as we'd call them, which are focused on material piety as opposed to even getting to the point of spiritual piety. So it's a stepwise thing. It's not going to happen um, necessarily overnight for everyone. Um, and that's why that's there. These are stepping stones. The yoga ladder is, that's why it's called a ladder. Um, one of the things I actually I, I missed to point out is that whilst we talk about the yoga ladder as being a ladder and kind of very clear steps, it's not really like that. I mean, the steps are not so distinctly uh, separated. Um, there's a huge amount of overlap and one can be at different you know, aspects of different stages and different points. Uh, but the, but the, the ladder kind of framework just helps clarify, I think, for our thinking, the different things which Krishna is referring to in the Gita. So that's why it's presented like that. Thank you. And there's a, another question which is quite similar. Maybe we can do a follow-up. Um, can, you, can you perform bad activities of devotion and offer it to Krishna? And what is the result of that? Can you if, perform bad activities with devotion for Krishna? So, <laughs> um, the, the, yeah. so these things uh, which are, which, 
when you say bad, I, I mean, like, like if we take an extreme example, if we're talking about something criminal, let's say, so I'm going to steal something and I'm going to offer the money to Krishna, right? Like that's the that's the thing. But yeah, okay. So. Um, The, the point here is that how many people can do something bad truly for Krishna? Like, so how many people are actually stealing really for Krishna as opposed to for them? And I'm not just talking about the money for themselves, but I'm talking about the, the praise or the prestige or whatever else that might come with that. So these things are typically tinged with something. So what to speak of just the the external point of that, um, you know, people, people, are, people are not going um, to, to, to lie, to steal, to do these things. Now, obviously, there are, there are complicated situations in which some of these things actually may be necessary. Um, but to divide these things up into what is essential and necessary for survival, for example. Um, but again, who is that for? So to think that I'm going to proactively do something in a, not, in a non-essential place for Krishna um, is usually a slippery slope. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, next question. So the Gita is an ancient text. It doesn't really take into consideration the complexities of today's world. So would you say the Gita is relevant today in 2022? Yeah, okay. So this, uh, the question of kind of how old is the text comes up a lot and um, my text is older than your text type of stuff. And, um, and some, some argue that actually the dating of the text and the age of the text don't matter. Um, I actually don't think that's true. I think the dating of the text does matter. And the reason why I think it matters is for two reasons. One is because actually this, the test of time is a very effective test. So um, uh, that that test of time, which is the the uh, the the amalgamation of centuries of testing, and and still continues to be effective, is more indicative of its effectiveness than an individual necessary than one individual and one experience, in from one perspective. It's not denying the individual experience, but the point being that this has been practiced over centuries and millennia. So I think the dating of it and the fact that it's ancient is not, um, is not in any way minimizing its uh, validity or its relevance to today. I think it actually in many ways um, enforces it, um, reinforces it. And I think the second um, point about it, so one is about the, the fact of the, you know, the te over a long period of time. Um, and the other reason why I think it's important in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of why these things are important is because it also points to originality. So like, if you come up with an idea and I come up with an idea the next day, I mean, you know, the, 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 the reference point in terms of faith and credibility in what you've said and its effect on what else you might have said increases. And therefore, um, there are lots of concepts within the Bhagavatam um, and in the Gita, the Vedic tradition, which have, have highlighted some really interesting um, things. And I think that maybe it's a, it's a topic for another session, but uh, to go through, you know, I, I remember when I was reading the Bhagavatam the first time, uh, the Bhagavad Purana is, a, is another Vedic text, which uh, we, we won't get into the detail of that. But essentially, in that text, um, there, are, there are stories about the relativity of time. How time is different in one part of the universe to another part of the universe. And when you're reading these stories, and they're not, it's not just kind of, um, uh, it's not just uh, vague in this description, it's very precise. So the time description in the Bhagavatam is extremely precise, going all the way down to atomic time. So when it's talking about the, distinct, the, the, the relative effect of time, from one perspective you can think, well, you know, it's a story. But it occurs more than once, and it occurs more than once with quite definitive uh, uh, references. So now, had somebody um, 
taken that and built upon that before Einstein did, um, it would be quite interesting um, to, to be able to inform other uh, discoveries based upon what the Bhagavatam is saying. And, so therefore, and there are lots of examples, we won't get that into today, but the point being that I do believe that the, the dating of a text is important. So for these two reasons. And coming on to the point of um, you know, uh, it, it not taking into account modern context. Honestly, this is one of those things that you're not going to believe it until you, until you try it, right? So I think with all of these things, and pick up the Gita and open up any verse, and you see for yourself if it's relevant to you or not. I mean, when I, when I read the Gita and I read the descriptions of different personalities, different psychologies, different ways of people looking at the world and whatever, or the gunas, like we were talking about the modes of material nature. Um, I mean, in the Gita, Krishna's categorized everything from charity to food. And he's categorizing it in a way which I think is absolutely <coughs> relevant to today. And including the psychologies that he's describing of different types of people that, who come to him or who don't come to him. Or, or, what, whatever aspect you want to look at. You know, the metaphors that Krishna gives in chapter 2 of the Gita about how um, the soul's identity is eternal or the changing of the body um, uh, and the metaphor he gives us as the body, um, as we change clothes. You know, we change old clothes for new clothes. So the soul gives up old bodies and takes on new ones. So, I mean, there are so many things which I think, and, and, and like I said, the fact that there is the test of time ensures that today the Gita is being read. In fact, there's more Gitas being read today than there were whatever, at least hundreds of years ago, if not thousands of years ago, all around the world and in however many different languages, I don't know. But um, I, I think it's relevant. And I think you can only tell that if you, if you pick it up and look. Wonderful. And so based on that, um, how would you say the Gita or its teachings would help with problems such as war in today's society? I think um, whilst the Gita may not have um, specific instructions, well it has a little bit, but specific instructions on um, you know, war and uh, its uh, tactics and all the rest of it. Uh, the Gita is set on a battlefield and I think the greatest contribution in that respect is in the prevention of war. If you look at the way that Gita is speaking about the ethics that sit behind action and sit behind leadership. Um, these are things that if we understood a bit better, um, we probably wouldn't have so much room. And, and I think that's where the Gita, not just, not just from, the, not from, the, not from the perspective of being a pacifist, but from the perspective of actually, if you're going to take a certain action, the motivation that sits behind that action and how do we, as individuals who don't make those decisions, how do we decide about who's qualified to lead a country um, and our leadership and how we perceive the qualities of what we seek in a leader? I think these are, these are important questions for us to answer and for us to understand. Like if we have, have uh, a better understanding of that, then hopefully we'll make good choices in terms of society and our role in it. Great, thank you. So, next question. So why is there such a difference in opinion in Hinduism on what is God? So some believe that we are all God, some believe that they are God, and some do not think that we are as God at all. So why is it so complicated? Yeah. I mean, part of the reason is because the Vedic tradition is a, is a tradition that accommodates for everyone in society. It's not an exclusive-ist tradition. Um, it's a tradition that is supposed to be implemented in a society that is for everyone. So um, it is pluralistic in that sense, in that um, even in ancient times, you know, there's a famous, one of my favorite verses actually in the Gita, chapter two, Krishna goes through a whole description of, of the different attributes of the soul, different ways of understanding the soul, etc. It goes, gives some really powerful examples and, uh, and then at, at, at the end of that little section he, he says, well, 
even then if you don't believe in the soul. So clearly there were people who didn't believe in the soul because he's, he's making that assumption. So the idea that there were always people who, um, and even in the classical Vedic schools, of, uh, schools of Vedanta, like there, there, are, there are schools which don't believe, <coughs> Karma Mimamsha, others who, who don't believe in um, uh, necessarily a god. So um, that's there, it's not new. Atheism is not a new thing. Um, and nor is the, the, uh, the, the kind of understanding that there are different features of God. So one is, um, like we spoke about, an impersonal, impersonal kind of light or whatever that people may aspire to. Um, one is the divinity within every living being and the other is the personal, supreme, transcendent form of God. And, um, the Vedas speak about all three of these. And so it's not, a, it's not a, you know, you can think about it in different ways. You can think about it in the story of the, the blind man and the elephant. You can think about it in terms of relative and absolute truth and perspectives or however you want to think about it. But the point is that the Vedic tradition does describe a multitude of the features of divinity in a way which may be uh, unique and uh, therefore potentially confusing. But that's why the Gita, in just 700 verses, you know, to read the Gita will take you less than two hours, an hour if you're really quick, but less than two hours if you just read the if verses. So within two hours, you can read the whole Gita. And like, that's a small amount of time in terms of an investment of time. It's a small amount of time. Today's Gita Jayanti, just to remind everyone, so good day to start. But you know, to, to, to read that, just the 700 verses, in there, Krishna makes it so clear the, the distinctions between the impersonal, uh, the divinity within each being himself as, as the embodiment or the personality of God, and also the role and position of the devatas um, in a way which you know, doesn't really leave room for confusion. Um, <coughs> pluralism doesn't mean a free fall, nor does it mean a kind of just complete confusion and anarchy. Um, uh, there's a, there's, whilst it's complex, um, it's, it's also clear. Wonderful, thank you. Um, <coughs> I just thought that since there's lots of questions being asked, um, and I don't know who's asking, if you do have any follow-up questions, you can raise your hand, or if anyone wants to ask a question in person as Um, when you were explaining the yoga ladder, hmm. one of the steps was uh, doing your work uh, with, a, with a feeling of detachment. And I was just thinking, how do you practically do that? Because we're, we are all naturally motivated hmm. by results. Yeah. We kind of, we speak about it, you know, like it's an easy thing to do. Just like, yeah. oh yeah, just work. It's, it's the endeavor that matters. Don't worry about the results. But from a human level, whatever our motivation, we are all driven by results. So how does one practically work? without attachment for results, whether that's offering to God or not, just to work without attachment to results? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, it's one of the things which I think does cause some confusion about the way the Gita is presented. Um, and Arjun helpfully clarifies that to, in his questions to Krishna because uh, he poses um, a couple of times in the Gita this idea that is there, is there a, an opposition here between detachment and work. So he's saying, basically, what are you saying? You want me to detach or you want me to work? Which one is it? Because like, normally when we think about it, we think detachment and work are opposed. I, I detach myself from the world and therefore stop working, or I work and I'm attached. But the whole point of the Gita's message is that you have to do both. You have to work and be detached. And that's... Um, uh, that is the art of work, if you like. Um, uh, and in terms, of, in terms of how you would do that, in terms of how that's possible. Um, you know, there are, there are different ways that you can come at it from, but one of, the, one of the simple ways of thinking about it is um, requires a little bit of um, focus, not, not focus, um, I suppose, a change of perspective and appreciating that what is it in this world that is ours? 
So we can do some exercises, we can do some thought um, experiments about how to shift our perspective into this new mindset. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that is, is this idea that, you know, we think about this idea that, well, let's say, you know, you, one of the steps in the yoga ladder is offering something to the divine, right? So it could be a flower or it could be whatever, food or money or whatever. And, um, but a step then further removed from that is, well, was that ever mine in the first place? And by that I mean that if we can take it from two perspectives, one is uh, who is the proprietor, if you like, of everything? And it's, is it me? <laughs> you know, and, and, and if, that, if it's not me, then, and if that doesn't belong to me, then um, where is the where is the where is the point of being of feeling that it is mine? So, uh, so that's one perspective, and the other perspective is that when we when we offer something, um, the the notion of I suppose um, it's a process which for ourselves is. Um, in any, in, in any relationship, that relationship develops through exchange. And part of that exchange is in offering. Um, now, whether that's with your family or whatever, but the, and the idea is in the Gita is explained that that relationship with Krishna can be developed through those offerings. And so by offering things, even when we are attached, um, that leads to a development of relationship. And that relationship then reciprocates back into raising, rising levels of detachment. But in terms of how we're engaged in our work, for example, and how am, I, how am I going to work, working, and then becoming detached from my paycheck, or whatever. So, um, but the idea is that unless, unless, we are, un, 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 unless we take small steps in that direction, the full realization of that just won't arise. So we start with small things that we don't mind being detached from. And that then increases into other areas of our life where we, we understand more the principle that we should and are becoming increasingly detached. Um, yeah, but I think like to go straight from like being fully attached to detached is not the way it works. Like we go through things which we are more comfortable becoming detached from and then from there going to things that we are less comfortable beca becoming detached from. Um, yeah, I feel like I haven't really answered your question though. Anyone else want to contribute to that? Because I've. Can I say one thing? Yeah, please. Uh, I think the, the one thing, the one thing that many people misunderstand, I think perhaps even in the way we use the language, there was some allusion to that earlier mm. on, is um, uh, and many Western academics make this mistake. They say that actually Krishna is recommended we don't think about the results. Right. And that is absolutely wrong. Um, it's interesting that the term we use, or the ET uses, is fruits. Yep. Um, and, and the idea is there that underlying that is one often tries to enjoy the fruits, to get some juice from it. Um, so there is a misunderstanding there um, that. Uh, not enjoying the fruits or what Krishna is instructing to Arjuna is not to think about the results. Yeah. But there's a complete difference between thinking about the results and making sure that we act appropriately with some consideration of the results as well as duty and the desire to enjoy yeah. the results. So I think that's true. But I think your point was very, very important. I think the whole point of this is that um, what differentiates, I think, the Vedic tradition from many other religions is that idea of progress yeah. and different standards for different people. Yeah. Rather than just trying to set one set of, for example, values for everyone, yeah. but having different sets of values, and I think that's really important. And I think your point about actually gradually moving, uh, we're going to be motivated. And, and that, I think probably the, one of the biggest pitfalls is to try and pretend that we're not motivated. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is my motivation. How do I use that 
there's actually motivation and desire, um, although there are some um, interpreters of the Gita would say it's about giving up desire, nishkarma karma. Um, ultimately, the Bhakti tradition says no. <laughs> desire is uh, an integral part of the self. Mm. Uh, and, and, and therefore, in a sense, there is a... Um, one interpretation could be that we need to dovetail that desire and uh, perhaps even strengthen that desire to do something good in the world and to offer those fruits to, to the Supreme yeah. rather than trying to enjoy them for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no, it does for sure. And it's actually jogged my memory. There's a, I just, uh, there's a verse that you, you reminded me of. It says, one who restrains the senses of action but whose mind dwells on sense objects certainly deludes himself and is called a pretender. And uh, the Gita warns about this. I think it's, for me it was again one of the real interesting messages of the Gita is don't be a hypocrite. Like be where you are, but be sincere and genuine as to where you are. Because if you're sincere and genuine as to where you are on the yoga ladder, you'll keep going up. But if you pretend, you'll go down. And um, to your point about, sorry, I'm kind of my brain's kicking into gear a bit now. So to your um, point about how does one remain detached? So Rasamana was speaking about you know, the difference between kind of being attentive to the results because we want to offer those results versus being detached from the results. And one of the, um, one of the uh, examples I, I found really helpful was, you know, somebody goes into a bank. They go into the bank and they say, I'm detached from all the money in this bank. I renounce it. So it's like, that's a bit stupid, right? Because it's not yours in the first place. <laughs> so um, that's the kind of situation we find ourselves in the world, to some extent, because we look around and we feel, there's one part of us which may feel like the, all of this stuff is here for my enjoyment. And there's another part of us when, when our understanding starts to mature a bit that this was never mine in the first place. Like, I'm supposed to be a custodian or looking after these things. Uh, it's not mine to enjoy. And, and I think the more that we can try and um, cultivate a bit more of a finer understanding in terms of our role in this world, the fact that we came here with nothing, <laughs> we're going to leave with nothing, and you know, through this transitionary period, we're here to look after stuff. We're not here to just exploit it. And this continual kind of exploitation and drive towards exploiting stuff, which we see in the world, and is a symptom of, well, the very first ground level of hedonism that we talked about, um, it's just destructive. And, and I think if we can get to a place where we start to understand that this is not mine to do what I want with, then we can start to work with detachment. Because now we're working for something bigger than ourselves. Because if we're just working for ourselves, then you work with pure attachment. But just like, you know, in the beginning, somebody's selfish, they, they start, they're just thinking about themselves. You know, we know, like, you have a family, you're working, you're doing whatever, and there's a level of detachment, a level of detachment that comes, because you're not just working for yourself. You're working now for other people. But then if you keep expanding that out, to work for the community, work for the world, work for every living being. I mean, the idea is that you are then working for God. You're, you're offering those results, those fruits, um, to, to divinity. And uh, that beca that's a gradual process. But as I said, the key point in that process is to be sincere about where we are on the yoga ladder. And that's why I think the yoga ladder is so helpful, because it tells us where we are right now and what our next step is. And that's what we know is the key to progress. I have to know where I am now, and I have to know where I have to get to. And I have to know how to get from here to there. And that's what the Yoga Ladder does. It tells us where I am now, where I need to go, and how I to get there. So I think that's, that's um, probably a slightly better response. Thank you for jogging my memory. <laughs> is there any other questions um, on that side? Um, well, one of the things that I personally find quite challenging is that when you try and understand the philosophy, it's very hard to understand 
um, practically implement it. So if I said you know, to you, you know, Rishi Sunak sitting in this chair here, and he asks you, what can I implement from the Bhagavad Gita in my day to day? You know, what, what change can I make that's going to be a benefit to my society, to the people that, I, that I'm leading? What would you say to him? Mm. I'd say a lot. <laughs> but I would start with, um, should have gone to an Avanti school. But now that you didn't, um, no, I, I think, look, I think there are, there are um, some really important principles that the Gita gives us. And I think it's true, so much so for leaders, um, as Krishna says in the Gita, you know, whatever gr an act, a, a person in great responsibility does, other people follow. So, um, you, one of the, one of the, again, one of the really profound principles that I, I see in the Gita, which is so important, this idea of not pretending is, the, the, taking that a step further is setting an example. So this, the word Acharya, like this word of, you know, like teaching by example, it comes from the Vedic tradition in the sense of, well, not exclusively, I'm sure, but the, it's certainly rooted in the Vedic tradition that uh, one sets an example, like people, people will listen and follow what you do, right? Not just what you say. And um, that's a huge deficit, I think, in leadership as we see it. Because we think, even as parents, we think that kids or others follow what we say. But we know internally that's just not true. Uh, they will do what we do. So, um, so there's a bit about hypocrisy which has led to undermining the whole religious enterprise in terms of how hypocrisy has become so pervasive. But it's also true of leadership and political leadership. That there's such an, there is undeniably so much hypocrisy in uh, politics. And like that sounds like a very basic thing to say, um, but it's so prevalent and it, and it keeps recurring. So that's one thing. Um, I think the values, and not just the, va uh, you know, uh, the idea of differentiated values uh, is a really important one. There are universal values, um, and there are values which are relevant for different people at different stages and um, psychologies. And the idea that as a society, we need to be driven by values and be explicit about what those values are and how some are relative and some are universal and how that then impacts on what we push as a society, how that then underpins policy decisions and you know, um, uh, what, what government does or does not do. And I think those things are, uh, I mean, that's just one aspect of, of, in terms of the values perspective and how the Gita will inform uh, an ethic to society. And, um, and I think the spiritual pursuit, look, I think perhaps, and this is one of the things that we're working on really um, importantly for Avanti, is that, you know, the Gita offers a framework for universal spirituality in a way which I think is very important for us to pay attention to. So, one of the things that divides society we know is religion, potentially. And uh, the Gita comes from it from the perspective of a universal approach to spirituality that can unite as opposed to divide. And I think it provides a framework and an approach and a philosophy that can inform conversations about how you can bring communities together not necessarily converting and being the same. That's not the idea or the goal. That, that's one way of, for, you know, of creating uniformity, right? That's not the Gita's idea. It is of, you know, I'm sure, like in some societies, that would be the way in which you create uniformity. The Gita's approach is actually equality based on a spiritual principle. That, that's the way that you can get to equality. There's a lot of conversation about equality nowadays. And the Gita's perspective on equality is on the spiritual level. There's, um, 
you know, lots of texts in the Gita, a lot of verses in the Gita which speak specifically about this. So how do we create, how do we create a society where it's not just about tolerating? Because that's a word that's used a lot as a British value. I tolerate you because you, you have a different religion, so I tolerate you. I mean, the Gita goes way beyond tolerance. Tolerance is a pretty low bar, if you think about it. Like, I mean, if you said to me, I'm tolerating you, I, it's, not, it's not very, you know. So like, it's, it's, it goes way beyond tolerance. It goes to how do we understand different perspectives in a way which is unifying? And that's an important lesson for us as a society. And these are big things, right? So they're not, it's not like um, a, a tick box exercise. But unless you get to the big things, the other stuff is just transitory. Like, we have to fix stuff at a fundamental level. And if people are always constantly thinking about the, the division of society, in whichever way you think about it, or the inequality in society, and trying to fix inequality at a material level, it's just not going to work. Because really, real equality only happens at a spiritual level. Because at a superficial bodily level, there isn't equality. You can try all you like, but there isn't genuine equality because there are differences and you have to be able to recognize the difference. If you can't recognize the difference, you're just going to go in circles. And that's what society is doing right now. And I think the Gita comes at it from a spiritual perspective, which it would, you know, we would all benefit from acknowledging that that's, at that level, you can get to a place where you have real equality and, and then things change. So, I don't know, I mean, I'll send them a voice note. <laughs>
uh, from a Vedic tradition, like, uh, it's okay, the world's one family, right? Everyone's on the same path. Other traditions may not be happy with that uh, perspective. But the Vedic perspective is that uh, we, can, we can all go towards the same ultimate, because there is one ultimate reality. If there is, if there is a God, he's your God as much as he is my God, right? I mean, like, there's not going to be a different God for each of us. So, uh, and if that's the case, um, then in the same way that the Vedic tradition says that God has different forms, the Vedic tradition also says he has different names. And, and there are different teachings in different parts of the world that are suited to time, place and circumstance. And so there's no contradiction between somebody following a certain path. But it's the mood and the sincerity and the love with which, with, with which they do that that's the important essential piece here about what Krishna is saying in the verse that you quoted that give up these different types of dharma Krishna there is talking about give up give up if you are ready to is the in parenthesis right because he's speaking to Arjuna so he's speaking to an individual so if somebody is ready to do that they can give up all the other kind of substrata stuff and go straight to an, an unalloyed or unadulterated spiritual practice which doesn't include all the other stuff that religion does as scaffolding for the rest of us who can't give it up. Because if we can't go straight to that level, we need some scaffolding, right? We need some, well, we need a ladder, right, to help us up. And that's what the yoga ladder is doing. Is that clear? Thanks. Yeah, just like, um, add, to, add to that. So, um, I, I understood what you meant, I think. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it expressed in a different way. Um, and the fact that that verse, I can't remember what it was, but it was at the end of the Gita. Mm -hmm. So it made sense what you were saying. But I've heard it expressed in a different way, and I just wanted to share it. The way I've heard it expressed is that um, if you are given a boat to travel to the other shore, when you reach the other shore, you don't pick up the boat and carry it on your back. You, you, you no longer need you no longer need the boat because you've reached you've reached the other shore. So it's kind of um, the way I understood that is um, it's kind of like the Gita or the Bible or which, whichever text, whichever mechanisms is like the boat. But once you've understood you've reached the other shore, you don't really need you know to sort of um, because you, you can't reach the other shore. So. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I'd qualify that. No, no, no. I, I think there's a helpful kernel of truth in that. I think there's a... I'd qualify that, though. Um, all, all of the, um, the different teachings within different scriptures, um, put, and I'll speak about the Gita because I know the Gita better, um, they, have, they, they are speaking to people at different levels. But the essence of the Gita... Um, is not is 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 relevant to anyone at any stage. So the essence of the Gita is relevant at any stage of the yoga ladder, including the highest levels. So it's not something to be given up. The relationship that Krishna speaks of, the reciprocal loving relationship that one achieves and attains with Krishna, which is which is an eternal relationship, but one that's been forgotten. The one that the relationship that's been that becomes reawakened through the process of yoga. That relationship and the nature of that relationship, which Krishna speaks of, that's not a, that's not a transitory thing. That's something that lasts in, for eternity. And that's why Krishna is describing that eternal state. So there are some aspects of the Gita which I completely agree. You know, Krishna is speaking about things like the gunas, for example, and rising up the gunas, and then you give up that process of rising up the gunas once you've passed the gunas. But there are other aspects of the Gita which are for eternity. So, uh, depending on what part of the Gita you're speaking about. That's great, thanks. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. We've probably got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, yeah. um, so yoga um, is quite prevalent all over the world, and um, we know yoga comes from a Vedic, system, Vedic tradition, but what Krishna is saying in the Gita about yoga seems quite different from what the world understands as yoga. So, are they the same thing or has something been lost in the 
Yeah, so the David Lloyd's yoga <laughs> is um, not quite the Bhagavad Gita <laughs> yoga. Um, but, uh, you know, we describe these different types of yoga. And one aspect of that yoga is uh, called Ashtanga yoga. And um, Ashtanga yoga is a mechanical process. And it's, it was, you know, it's, it's, uh, it takes many, many years to perfect, which is why it's not really practiced um, today. Uh, but the Ashtanga yoga, you can tell from the word, has eight steps. And those steps are a way to appeal to somebody who isn't ready necessarily for a direct spiritual path but takes them gradually through those steps. So Ashtanga is actually was part of the yoga ladder. Um, and those steps are including like rules and regulations and then some physical postures, breathing exercises, um, internal meditation. And those, those rules and regulations, breathing postures, physical um, uh, sta uh, postures, uh, they're, all, they're all there as preliminary steps to get us to a place where we can meditate. And that meditation starts by withdrawing the senses from uh, external engagement. Krishna speaks about it like a tortoise withdrawing its limbs. Then uh, once that absorption takes place, real um, deeper meditation on the internal um, super self and then realization of the super self or samadhi, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a stepwise process of Ashtanga Yoga. And now what's happened is obviously the Hatha Yoga like the, or, the, or the Prana Yoga, the idea of focusing in on two aspects predominantly because we don't like the, the yama and niyam. We don't like the rules and regulations because those are hard because they're like don't do this and don't do that and don't drink alcohol and don't eat meat and these kinds of things. So we'll skip that step and then we'll go straight to the stuff that uh, we want to do which is um, body postures and breathing. So um, they have an effect. They have some effect. It's not that you won't see any benefit from it. But in terms of the benefit that the, Ash the original Ashtanga Yoga system is driving to is realization of the self and divinity. And that's not often found in David Lloyd, right? So like that's something which takes a different path. But there is some preliminary or kind of surface level benefit that one gets, right? And that, but that's not, even though it's, um, packaged as yoga, it's not really about yoga. I mean, that's like if you just sit down and um, close your eyes, focus on your breathing. I mean, I know nothing about prana pranayam, but like basic breathing stuff. Because generally, because of the level of the way that we live, we don't even breathe properly normally. So now you have breathing coaches, right? They charge about 300 pounds an hour, apparently. <coughs> so um, you have breathing coaches. So they'll show you how to breathe. Why? Because we know how to breathe. And that's not a yoga thing. So the yoga system of breathing is a very complex way of breathing. So when, they, when they're doing it nowadays, it's not the, the original pranayam system. It's just, you know, I mean, it's like I can teach you that for 300 pounds an hour. So like, you know, it's a, it's a very basic level of breathing. And the same thing with postures. Like the postures that were practiced were not postures that, you know, now we'll touch our toes and now we'll do this and this tree pose and this whatever pose. So, and we do that, you know, we do some of this stuff in schools too, right? Like, because it's, a, it's an easy way in to be able to at least bring some um, calm, some release of anxiety, some introspection, some peaceful state where one can think about something. So that's what I'm saying is that the Ashtanga system is just a highly complex, completely, uh, completely, but you know, a, highly unlikely that it's going to be practiced in today's age. It's just, it's just too demanding in, in what it's asking. But derivations of the Ashtanga system, particularly Hatha Yoga and Pranayam in terms of bodily postures and breathing exercise, derivations of that are helpful because they have some effect. And at least they can put us in a state where we might be more perceptive um, to our own state and more open to elevating our state of consciousness in terms of um, some uh, spiritual reflection. So definitely not the same, um, but you know, uh, there's, some, there's some superficial benefit to be had, but in today's context, that even that superficial benefit is probably worth something. Is that okay? Yeah, 
Um, and there seems to be quite a lot of um, kind of instructions that go through the bug meter, um, and kind of makes it confusing. I just wanted to ask, what would you recommend where you would start with your kind of spiritual practice if you were going to go down that path? <coughs> okay. Um, I'd probably say a couple of things, real simple, easy ones. Um, I think the first one is um, start reading the Gita. Um, that's a real easy one. It takes two minutes a day. Um, but genuinely, I think that's a really important one. Because I think there's one thing for me to sit here and answer questions and to try and summarize what I think is important from the Gita for you. And if you've been paying attention to what we've been saying here, you know, Krishna speaks to us and we're not all at the same place in terms of what would be beneficial to us. So it's important that you allow that interaction at an individual level. Because, you know, there's a few hundred people in this room. I mean, I, whatever I say is not going to be relevant to everyone. So, um, I think, uh, I think it's important that that interaction takes place between the individual and what Krishna is saying in the Gita to see what actually speaks to them. Um, the other is that there are different spiritual practices explained in the Gita. And, you know, you can, you can experiment with this stuff. Like you can, the whole, the, one of the key things of the, the Gita, one of the most attractive things of the Gita is that it is experiential. Like whatever we're doing there, it's not supposed to be purely a kind of instructional text that I tell you to do ABC, you do ABC regardless of anything else, you just do ABC. And you keep doing ABC. That's not the way the Gita is working. The Gita is a very dynamic text. And um, uh, th there's another text, which I, uh, another verse which, um, from another text which says that, you know, you have to do what works for you. So you try and you have to find what works for you. So there are different spiritual practices mentioned in the Gita. So there are certain things about um, things that we can remove from our life that may be harmful to our consciousness, um, which we learn from in the sections about, for example, the gunas, about the types of food we eat, about the types of activities we do, about the types of, you know, all of these things which are, they just, they just hold us back in terms of our spiritual pursuit. And then there are things that we can do, introduce into our life, whether that's forms of meditation. The Gita really explains quite clearly about mantra meditation, um, about focusing, because silent meditation is, is uh, possible for short periods of time, but the mind can very rarely be silent, if at all. It's, it, you know, even when we think we're being silent, we're not being silent because we're thinking we're being silent. So we're not, like, the mind is not silent. It's not in its nature to be silent. So the, 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 one of the powerful messages of the Gita is about we can, con we can start to begin to rein in the mind and the senses by attaining something that's higher. I mean, we see this with kids all the time, right? You want them to give up something, you have to give them something better. So it's that with the mind. If you want the mind to stop being distracted by unnecessary, harmful things, you have to give it something better to think about. And that's why the mantra is important, because the mantra allows us to focus the mind on that. Um, other things, you know, we spoke about the yoga ladder, and we spoke about offering things. So, um, just small steps towards detachment, like offering a flower to whether you have a shrine or, you know, something at home the way you can uh, physically engage with a practice of offering, because you know, often sometimes what happens is that we think we'll change our consciousness, but to change consciousness is not an easy thing. Like to change a mindset is not an easy thing, and therefore sometimes a physical activity helps with changing that consciousness. So the activity of offering something physically helps with changing the consciousness of becoming more detached. So, um, you know, this is something found in so many traditions. You say a prayer or a, a form of gratitude towards. Uh, divinity before you eat. So something simple like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, uh, there are many different things that you could do, but whatever appeals to you, whatever, you know, you feel. But I think that's, um, 
I think being able to explore the options is an important aspect of our own spiritual journey. Like we all have to go on our own journey. Um, and the Gita very helpfully sets it out, which is why I'm encouraging you to all to take a look. Is that okay? Thank you. Wonderful. So, um, I'm looking on the app as well, and I've seen there's over 40 questions remaining. I know there are still a few more hands up, but unfortunately we are out of time there. Um, so just before we end off, there's a few announcements to make, but before that, maybe we can give Nidesh a massive round of applause. Those of you who maybe didn't check the emails, you may be expecting to see our guest, um, Dr. Sriyanka, be here. But unfortunately, like we sent out, he's not feeling so well today. But Nitesh very kindly stood off to continue with today's session. And I think, um, at least on my side, I can say it happened for a reason. Uh, it is Gita Jain today, and I think it was really lovely from my side, at least, to hear from, about the Gita, hear the different lessons and principles. Um, and on that.